Okay. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second session of OAuth. So this is the not well. Um, again, a reminder, this governs everything that we do at the ITF. If you're not familiar with this, please get familiar with this. It's important. So these are the tips on how to use the tools. We, we went through those. Hopefully you're already familiar with them. I'm not gonna repeat those. Uh, so before we start, um, some not pleasant news. Um, some of you might have noticed that Vittorio is not here. Um, um, and many of you know, know Vittorio as identity guru and icon in, in the ITF. And, and with, 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 this, um, with this work group, um, he's not feeling well, unfortunately. He, he's battling cancer. Uh, we miss him here. Uh, we, we hope to see him in the future. Um, our thoughts and prayers uh, is with him. Um, stay strong, Vittorio, stay, stay strong, my friend. So uh, we miss him. So I'll, I'll leave it here for a second. And if anybody has any thoughts and want to share anything, feel free to do that. Okay. Okay. Go ahead there, Brian. I, I don't know how to add much to that, but he is a guru and an icon, but he's also a a teacher and someone who's tremendously uh, generous with his time to people and I consider him a teacher and a friend too. And, uh, Thanks, Brian. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> So quick update on the IED program. So we had that discussion yesterday started and at the IED open a meeting. Um, we're gonna continue that discussion at the SAG meeting tomorrow. Um, so Colin, Dick and, and myself will be kind of presenting this again and maybe taking a different angle at it and, and see how, how it goes. So please uh, make sure to join the SAG meeting tomorrow uh, at 3.30. Um, reminder, the OAuth security workshop is, uh, is uh, open and uh, it's gonna be in London. So if you're interested, please register. Okay, today's agenda, um, Dick will be talking about JOT embedded tokens. Um, and then George will be talking about transaction tokens. Uh, Peter will be talking about cross-domain identity chaining and uh, Aaron will uh, wrap it up with first party native apps. And uh, reminder that we still have Friday, um, which is dedicated to verifiable credentials. So make sure to attend that, that meeting. Any comment about the agenda here? Okay, Dick. Do you want me to drive from here? Okay. Right. okay. Good morning, everybody. Dick Hart. And hi, Mike. How are you, Mike? Oh, excellent. How's everybody else? Everybody awake? Everyone's got a coffee? <laughs> I hope so. This, this isn't going to be a session if you just tune out, you're not participating. This is a participatory session. Um, so 
what problems are we trying to solve with embedded tokens? It's so some of those are, you know, how I got involved with that is like you might have claims from a number of different issuers around the user as identity claims, and you're going to want to put them all together and bind them together into another token. Um, the use case from where is he at? Italy. Yeah. Giuseppe, right, is where you know there's a token that includes some other access tokens that have context because they're within this one token. <clears throat> and then there's a number of use cases where you're trying to have a chain of uh, tokens along and you're trying to say, okay, you know, it's a problem that many people building more complicated uh, infrastructure where, you know, a token comes in to one service and then way down there's a number of other services that are trying to understand the context of what happened at the beginning. And so, you know, there's uh, work happening in a couple of areas around how do you move that through. Does anybody not think these are problems to solve? <clears throat> Anybody? Anybody? Mueller? <laughs> okay, next slide. Um, so we went through some of those use cases um, specifically, and this particular draft is starting to get referenced by other drafts, which is a fairly strong indication that people are wanting something around this. Next slide. No. I'm going to go get my water. I'll be back. <laughs> uh, so if you have made the mistake of asking if I wanted to present at this meeting, and so I sat back and looked and thought, you know, how, what are all the really, you know, sitting back architecture, what are the approaches to solve this, right? There was, you know, some things going on and I realized that, you know, we don't necessarily need to standardize how tokens are embedded in other tokens. You know, we could let people make up their own claims and say what was inside of that claim, you know, so they could make up another claim, that claim could have just a token, right? So it's just a string value. It could be an array of strings, it could be an array of objects, or it could just be an object, right? But they would be able to define their own thing. I'll go into more detail into that. <clears throat> or we can have a general mechanism around how tokens are embedded in other tokens. And so you could start off with, it's just, you know, that there's, you know, the, in the doc, it's there's tokens and it's an array of objects. <clears throat> And then that type could either be, what I have is 2A is, it's a generic type of saying, you know, at a high level, the kind of token it is, and then there's potentially other claims within that object that give you more context. Or that type could be sort of more of a specific of this is this particular kind of token, you know, claim that's in there and provides more context as opposed to more generic high level. So I'll go into more detail in the next slides. So there's the two A, so the generic type where you know you've got a type and then you have a token, or you could have references to a token. You know, if it was like a type was, you know, this is an ID token reference, and then there'd be some reference things. Um, you know, or an access token or a reference. Any <clears throat> questions on this? You don't have to go to the mic. You can just put your hand up and tell me, and I'll repeat the question. Is everyone so, yes? That's all. So in the last meeting, I think there was a discussion about the possessor of the sort of the embedded token being able to reuse the token in some kind of token mechanism. Has that been addressed? <laughs> uh, I'm I'm pulling up at a more meta discussion as opposed to the specifics of that. But the, so the question was, what could somebody do with the token that's embedded? And my answer is the token type would say what you could go and do with it, right? That, that, or we could decide that there's some signaling. This is why there's sort of 2A and 2B. So a generic type could say, what can I do with the token potentially generically? Right, and that so it's an access token without saying what kind of access token or how it might be used. Or if we go to 2B, 
right? You can go and get specific of it's this particular kind of token, right? So this would be an example where the type is, you know, specified as being the Italian type for access. And so you know exactly what you can do about it because it's all defined by the type. Does that make sense? Go, go, go to the mic. Go to the mic. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Atul Tulshiba Gulay Signal. So I understand that, you know, there are claims within the embedded token that sort of talk about how that token could be used or what that, some qualification of that access token. But there seems to be an awful lot of trust that you're placing on the recipient of the embedded token that they cannot somehow abuse that you know, uh, the token and represent themselves as the party that was issued the token in the first place. Right. <clears throat> um, I think that's an important detail to talk about. Um, but um, the, what I'm working to describe is actually at a higher level around how do we, how do, we do these things? Okay. Um, so I, I think something like that is going to be, per my description here, right? It's either specified sort of directly by the type, by being very specific as a type of being saying, what are you allowed to do and what might happen and whether people should do it, right? And, and, and actually, per your question, I think that's sort of a security concern that if you're embedding a token, right, that people could abuse it, right? And so if you're embedding it, but that's an architectural decision. That's an architectural right, right. decision on right. the implementation yeah. and how they decide yeah. it and what they do with it. And, and yeah. sort of a, that's a lower level detail about if I'm embedding token, what could happen? Yes. So I, I, I think the, one of the considerations here is kind of how, how do I find my token inside of whatever bag of tokens if I'm part of an architecture that has multiple of these things used, right? That's number one, right? How can I find my stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, um, how do I ensure that n nobody in the middle just throws it away? Uh, that could be a, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, the, w once, once I'm in an architecture like this, participating as an entity, then I'm going to, some entity here is going to want to kind of get at its own part of, you know, that's the reason you have a, a generic uh, bag of tokens, right? That mm -hmm. you, you collect them in one place, right? And right? there's an advantage to yeah, it. Yes, yes exactly. Yeah. Right? So I am in, in the code, you know, I'm, I'm looking in the tokens <clears throat> list and I'm trying to find, you know, here, here's stuff relevant for me, right? Okay. Um, and th I think that's probably the only consideration you have to think about, right? Because <clears throat> you're not, if you're in this kind of architecture, it's going to be like the, it's going to be fairly tied to the business process that you're implementing, right? right? You're, you're not, there, there's no general or very few general processing rules here, right? Am I? Yeah. Um, so, well, this is why I'm bringing this up for discussion right. in the working group. And right? that's, yes. I guess that's the and part so of the discussion, right? There, yeah, right. There, there could be things that like if you're, uh, You've rephrased what I'm asking. Right. Yes, the, yes. What are the generic? Yes. What are the generic considerations? Is, is there and generic I'm, things right. or not? Right. Right. And or I'm. Should, or should I, everything I, just be specific? And I, I would yeah. come down. I guess I would argue that it, you know, keep it as simple as possible. Because right. the only thing you're going to want to do, I think, in this situation, is to find your thing. Mm -hmm. Well. And deal with it. Uh, potentially. Yeah. So. Yeah. I was going to go to the. I sort of gave my choices out of order. I did 2A and 2B because those are more aligned with what the doc is. And then the next one is one, which is like, we don't even spec a container. And we just say, do people just define their own top level token? And so, you know, per lease comments, like you just look at the top level, like why look in, if you're looking for some specific claims, right? You could just look at them at the top level. And um, yeah, but there, there is one, I made it a little bit too simple because there's one more generic consideration and that's that some middle thing doesn't strip out these things, right? So if you're, if you're doing that, there's the risk that somebody impl somebody's implementation tries to be very strict and goes, I, I don't recognize this claim, I'm gonna drop it on the floor or something like that. 
to pass it in, in when you're passing it through. Uh, if you, you can't take it out because then it's not signed anymore. No, right? if you absolutely, if you want to preserve the signature. Yeah, well, that's. Right? that's, that's but uh, there, you, there, you could take anything out, yeah. right? I mean, yes, but the, the, the use of a generic just, my, bag. My, yeah, right. my understanding of the spec, and Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're supposed to just ignore anything you don't understand. You're yeah. not supposed to. Or if, if everybody does that, then this is yeah. going to be good enough. Yeah, uh, well, it could be. I mean, so the potential pros to having some mechanism is that libraries then have understanding around what's there, right? That they can generically process and validate embedded tokens, maybe, right? I don't know. Hon the, um, Dick, yeah. I was wondering yeah. whether you have some form of, um, use some form of content type or something to um, indicate like register a specific tokens. Like in here you have the, the type. Um, I don't know if that type is sort of, it, it's, probably one way here you say ID token, yeah, but it's definitely. um yeah. like we have this content type mechanisms also in, in other places, uh, or media type, to just indicate to give enough information to pass the token and then to find out like uh, what to expect in there, like in general, because otherwise it could be anything, right? Like here you went a little bit overboard by having the type literally a URL. Um, and I don't know if that's that's where you want to go with it and just leave it I like completely open-ended. Three options that accomplish similar things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the point of the session here is to get feedback on the pros and cons on three different approaches. So I'm not recommending one approach. I'm trying to get feedback around. Well, one is, is there even value in specking a container and stuff? Because that's what this spec would be. Mm -hmm. And if option one, you're, you're my handy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there. If that's good enough, because people can just define their own high level URI and say what it does, and they could drive it, they could either standardize that or just use it, and the receiver looks at that. Mike? Mike Jones, um, I think option one's good enough. If you go with option two, I just wanted to point out that- 2A the, or 2B? Uh, option one, just let people use their own claims. I, I understand what your program, you're, you're making a comment against two, someone whether it's 2A or B or, or just both either. Um, I, I think, you know, the ability of generic processors to syntactically validate things is okay, but it's like, knowing something's a jot doesn't tell you the validation rules for it, uh, for what claims have to be present and whatnot. Um, I was just gonna say that if we go with a thing that uses type values, the OAuth token exchange spec already defines a bunch of type values that right. we could reuse. Yeah. You're on. So regardless of the solution uh, we, we pick at the end, I think it's important to say that we are conflating the name and the type. Where the name is what the application thinks this is versus the, and you might have four tokens that look very similar and have very different semantics for the application versus the type, which may be standardized, maybe by the Italian government, whatever, um, and denotes what a standard, a standard library can do with this token. Mm -hmm. So we can still only have one field and call it type, but it's really two different things. Uh, elaborate that on, oh. Again, one is what it looks like from the application's point of view, what role it holds for the application. This is like my third sibling as a person. Right. Um, and the type is what 
So there may be different uh, libraries or different ways to, to handle when well-known tokens, right. and that would be a type. Right, and so that is more like 2A, right, where it's a generic, more of a generic type of like it's this kind of token, but the specifics are potentially other. Uh, you're, you're, yeah, you're, you're still using the word type to, to I'm, I'm bundle not, the yep, two things I'm, together, I'm using but word, fine. Yeah, yeah, the typing is, there's slightly different meanings of what the word type means in these different pieces. Yeah. Yes. And personally, I, I actually prefer the URI option because it gives you cleaner uh, namespacing. So, right. Um, to be the, the fact that, to be clear, I just am making up strings to put in the things, as opposed to like the two A could still be a URI, but that it's kind of saying it's an ID token, but doesn't necessarily provide any context around why is this ID token in there or what does it mean or. Yeah, but the the benefit of having a URI is that you're commit you you're preventing uh, well, name collisions. It's very specific of exactly what it is. I, yeah, that's, that's okay. Yeah. So you're, <clears throat> and then if you go to one, right, which works the same, the same way, but now you don't have a wrapper and it's like, okay, you've just- Yeah, I don't have a preference. Okay, I mean, you've removed a layer of abstraction that maybe we don't need that layer. Maybe. Yeah. Who's up next, Ori or Lee? Um, Ori, let's go ahead. Ori Steele. Um, I'm sorry if this is going to make things more complicated for a second, but is the distributed and aggregated claims uh, concepts, are they related to this? Because um, they have a bucket structure. Uh, what's the, what the show? Can you show the container one? So it's, it's not this. Um, actually, the, the one with the delegate and uh, mother. It's like, is it, are they del distributed and aggregated claims in o OpenID Connect? Are, aren't they sort of like a version of this? Not? I'm we, just confused what, why we, th that wasn't, uh, is or, yeah. So, so we did look into that actually. And um, the goal of that is completely different from what we're suggesting here. Okay. Right. Leif. The, the, that, that, that again was a very specific kind of claim that had specific meaning, which is really option one, right? And so the question is, is should we have a generic way of putting tokens inside of tokens, right? Where the open ID one was, oh, these are claims inside of an ID token, right? Very much more specific. Okay. Anybody Did else? You... Yeah. I, I think uh, Mike had a good argument for why option one is good, but still kind of spec it out, right? Uh, it, it have a have a draft that actually says how you do this. And it might be already in the, you know, in the base spec that this, how you, this is a normal extension, right? But it could actually help people to, uh, understand because oh. you, you obviously asked the question why isn't this already in, in there right? and others will too so it might actually help to answer right. that question in the form of a draft okay yeah that's yeah. right as opposed to just not do anything mm -hmm. uh, describe and essentially it's kind of a best practice because it's not really normative but it's a spec around here's here's some guidance around how, how to do it um yeah it's a great idea because that could that kind of text around what the tool brought up um, around like, okay, be careful. Like somebody might get this and do things with it that we can have text around that, okay. Yeah, but, but you still have a normative text around how to interact with the AS to get that information, to embed and, and get that, the embedded one, right? So that's still in the document, right? we could define some specific, I mean, we could define some specific high level claims in it too. Absolutely, and, that, and that's what I'm saying. And general yeah. guidance for other people about how to do something like that. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Brian. Um, Brian? Is, isn't option one sort of, just clarifying, sort of like what Passport or STIR have already done? Is that 
more or mm. less like to find their be own cinnabar. claim. Like they didn't namespace it with a URI, but they're basically saying, hey, in our context, this claim carries yeah. one of their embedded tokens. Yeah. Is. So it's already kind of happening. Yeah, once again, the fact that it's a URI namespace is just, the, you know, somebody could define foo bar. Yeah, unicorns. well, and what I'm yeah. saying is they, they have, I yeah. Think, yeah. is yeah. my understanding. Yeah, yeah. and so, so they, the, they've taken approach one. And so I think oh. Leif was saying the document could, wouldn't be best practices so much as just. Seems, right, well, what, that seems heavy, but yeah, yeah, describe how you might go about doing that in your own application. Yeah. Well, what, I don't know. What Rufi had said without going to the mic was <laughs> there's a number of uh, concrete use cases now that we were looking to specify. And so we could specify those using mm -hmm. option one, mm -hmm. right? And so now you've got some specific examples. I see. Mm -hmm. And then you could have some general commentary about, you know, what you should do if you're going to define a new one. Here's some best practices. Sorry, but you yeah. were actually talking about some kind of wire protocol to request and receive right. these, right? Yeah, yeah. which right. is a whole whole separate issue. Yeah, but it's part. But, that's, of that, but that would be part. If, if yes, no, it's related. Uh, it's related. It's, it's yes. related. Yes, yes. It's related. Yeah. But it's, it's, yes. Yes. At this stage, it's in the same document, right? Yeah, it's in the same document. And yeah. sorry, we're like all over the place, but it's, it's also, it has a bunch of like non, like it's extending the token request, but it's the, doing it in like non-standard way. So it's kind of like broken. Okay, um, we, we can. Which is, but. Can look into to, that. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> should sure. probably, but I don't want to get into that necessarily. If it seems like the scope of what you're talking about here is just token formatting structure, not sorry. necessarily. The, it's a broader pick. It's a broader because once you have the format, then potentially you might need to describe how did that get in there. Potentially, right? right? And so some of the things on the table do require how did that get into there, and so they require some other protocol. And so the question is like, well, should those just be their own little doc because they're focused on just that as well, right? That it's like here's yeah. So are you saying that these should be completely different documents? I'm not, sort of. I, I, I sure. know, I'm, I'm looking at examples like Stir, like they don't, they just put a claim in there and they have their own okay. way of interacting that that has absolutely nothing to do with an okay. authorization server or not. So is okay. Maybe, okay. Yeah, well, uh, some, some might, right? Yeah, sure. Right. But, but are you saying it should be a separate document? I, I guess what I'm saying is a little more meta than that. It, it doesn't feel probably, but I'm not sure those documents even need to exist, or they are already separate documents that are solving it. Sorry. Well, it's it's like, um, of course, like absent a document providing any guidance and the mechanism, of course, they had to come up with something themselves. Yeah. It's like previously, like before yeah. we had the standardized uh, JWT, of course, people would you you're doing something on their own, uh, but then we make sure. recommendations. Yeah. Okay. I think my point's a little lost, but I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's a good point because yeah. you, you brought up an important point, which is there's more to what we were looking to spec besides just how did, what did the syntax of an embedded token, some of the embedded tokens, you're also specifying how did it go about getting in there, which is what Stir did. And that then starts to become a little more confusing around sort of general language about how should you embed tokens. Yeah, I guess so. I feel like the, the token structure and format, how they're actually embedded should be distinct from any kind of protocol interaction to request and receive these, I guess. Potentially, right? But the guy that the person that's implementing it, now they have to read two things to do something. Yeah, sure. Or the person that's implementing embedded tokens that already has their application specific way of obtaining those tokens doesn't want to read an uh, OAuth wire protocol that has absolutely nothing to do with what they're trying to accomplish. Okay. I, I yeah. see the argument on both sides, but it feels like it's overloading and mixing concerns around a question that's that, not even I agree. answered There's yet. two different things. And so you could either consider them from a from a document point of view, having them as separate documents is sort of cleaner. Um, but then there's a plus where anybody implementing needs to do both anyway. And so having one document sort of 
talking about. Here's if you have this kind of problem, here's the protocol part, and here's how you embed it. And the token is all in one doc for you to read to understand how to do it. Yeah, right. I, I understand that. Yeah, I, yeah, I, it, yeah. I, I don't know what the right answer is. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Okay. Yeah, but you brought up a useful point, which is like there's this other chunk of stuff that was in that is in the current draft, which is protocol related, mm -hmm. and not how do you just embed a token. Or, oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, and and if there is something to be fixed there, we'll we'll, yeah. we'll fix it, right? Hey, Peter. Um, Peter Castleman. Uh, so, I think given that there's valid use cases, whether this is a BCP or a, a standards document, I think having clear guidance for for people who need to solve for those use cases mm -hmm. is super useful, because if not, they will solve it on their own, and they will. It won't take long for people to do things that is dangerous, inappropriate, you know, access tokens getting embedded in other access yeah. tokens, that they're, kind of thing. They're probably doing something bad. Some, there's probably some people doing something bad now because there wasn't any guidance on it. And, and, so, <laughs> and so I think having that George, guidance... George is nodding his head like he's seen it. Or... Uh, I think we... Yeah. We, we, we've, all, we, we've all been there, right? So yeah. I think uh, it'd be supportive of having that guidance, that document, uh, whether it's one or two documents, right? That you can decide how you want right. to break that, I think, but I'm, I'd be supportive of having guidance. Okay. Yeah. And while you're up there, um, do you have a, a view on one versus two AB? I, um, I, I don't have a strong preference either way. I think um, the thing that whatever gives people per, I would almost say the more you can constrain it for people, the better. Um, you know, the more flexibility you're going to give folks, the more guidance you're going to have to give later. Uh, so think about what the minimum set of processing rules is that you want to, you know, what's the set of good things you want people to do, uh, and maybe use that as a, as a way to decide. Okay. Thank you. Dave Robin, speaking about the, the 2AB, I wanted to follow up on the name and type thing. Um, you show one type, but obviously if I have two tokens of the same type, I need some way of differentiating them. So I need a name in addition to the type. So um, that was yeah, right. That was the other the other argument on two A or B, either one of them. You have a type there, very specific type, but I've got two of these things. Yeah, it's an array. In though. the array, it, no, it's an array. But right. how do I know which one is which? There obviously needs to be a name or something usage. Agreed. Uh, how? Because mm -hmm. I got yep. two of the same type. So mm -hmm. clearly, you need so, a, well, an identifier here. That's maybe it which depends, one? It depends on. It's not going to be the first or the second. That would be bad. Well, as an example, right the. The embedded tokens, I'm just making shit up so I don't yeah. know that would ever happen, right? But what could be embedded would be certs from, or a token from, say, two different countries saying that you're a citizen of those two countries, right? So they're both equivalent, right? That's like, true. I might well, be their name in that case could be the same. I'm just saying there needs to be a usage identifier, not just a type. Uh, so yeah. citizenship would be the name. The type is a type that describes yeah, the structure, yeah. right? The, 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 and so I'd be fine this, with two this. things called citizenship, but there still needs to be something in addition to type. But that's not actually why I came to the mic. So, <laughs> right. Well, because um, if you go back, potentially you could have a type that's a this is a citizenship token, right? Which yeah, to be because it's different from the did, type. Type is more structural to me. On how you think it I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, okay. right? like, so going back now, since we're on that topic, hard, right? go back to one. <laughs> go back to your your number one option. This is yeah, effectively yeah. this <laughs> this uh, the thing in red is the name. It's because you have two of them. Obviously, you're going to have two different left hand sides. So it it tells you why it's here, what its purpose is, and type is none of your damn business. There's no indication of type here. Go look at the jot itself to figure out what type it is. So I'm kind of in supportive of this. However, I have a meta question. Okay. Why are we focusing on embedding tokens and guidance for tokens when this is already in the base spec? This is nothing but a custom claim and custom data. So why are we caring about tokens? Because I have people that want to embed ICSs in here to say when this, what periods and repeated this access to So let's talk about embedding ICS. It's a thing. Why, why are we concerned about embedding tokens as opposed to any other thing that you don't understand that I'm embedding? This is why we're having this discussion. Right. Yeah. Yes. So is it, is the, it because is, there's dangerous stuff that can be done with 
bad practice with tokens and we have to care about tokens and we don't care about my little ICS I'm throwing in there? <laughs> That's the question I'm asking. Okay. Right? Like, okay. is there value just, of having I mean, a container for tokens? Well, or the not? container, the 2A and 2B, are basically giving a semantic tag to this custom claim. Right. It's saying this custom right. claim that you have here. I don't know what it is, but if you wrap it in something called tokens, then I know it's a set of tokens. Right. And is that valuable? Is that valuable? I don't know. That's don't, the question. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know that it really is. I don't know. I don't know. Right. The earlier drafts did it. And I sat by and it's like, well, do we really need to wrap it? Is there value? And yeah, that's why. Just, sorry, just to sure. To emphasize yeah. all that. If I don't understand these tokens anyway, then it's just a semantic tag that says, by the way, this thing's a token, a wrapper. That's yep. all it does to me. Yep. So, that's okay. yeah. Yep. And that's a good argument for one again. The, the, I think my point for, was- A good argument for- For, for, for one. one, yes. Yep. But my point was that since both you and, and uh, Giuseppe is here, and both of you have read the base spec, right? Obviously you needed to help, you needed help answering this question, right? Which means that others were probably too. And that's an argument for, for actually writing down guidance on how to do. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm fully aligned with writing guidance is a great idea. Yeah. I've only gotten feedback that writing guidance is a good idea from a number of people. Does anybody think writing guidance is a bad idea and we shouldn't do anything? Anybody? Anybody? No. Okay. Okay. So. Brian, you had a comment. Okay. Let, let's let's uh, yes. and finish with this. Yes, yes. I, and we haven't heard anything contrary. I don't think it's a bad idea, but if it's bad guidance, we shouldn't give it to them. Well, I mean, so we need to be a little bit careful what we do. Yeah. But, but that's the whole reason for the discussion, uh, yeah. Brian, right? Uh, so. Yeah. So, yeah. so, Brian, I'm going to interpret that as a review volunteer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next. I, I have reviewed. <laughs> um, I think the protocol stuff should be pulled out and or fixed. But Black Two, I think option one would be the preferred here. Just and maybe another meta point, but as type is type is terribly, terribly overloaded, hard to understand. It's clear that we have no common understanding of it here. Mike recommended the URIs from token exchange, which are hard to understand and get confused. I wrote some of them, I don't understand them. We have typing of tokens and media types that are used in type headers or jots that frankly a lot of people don't understand, myself included, that get overloaded against that. Like it's it's really bad and it's really hard to do. So assigning type another set of semantics and expecting common processing from it. Okay. Uh, it's, it's like, it's, it's not gonna work out very well. So something more like one, I think, where all that stuff is defined by the context of use. Whoever's doing this defines the claim and says what it well, is. What all how the things it, are. Yeah. Is it an array, a string? Well, however object, the, yeah. Whatever. And yeah. all the things you need to know to use okay. it are defined there, I think is, is much more pragmatic, realistic, okay. and usable. And the idea of defining a generic container that's typed and library support for it work, there's a layer where that sounds really great, but I, I don't think it would work out well at all in practice. So okay. That'd be my, my vote for one with okay. a lot of fast talking words. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great feedback, guys. Okay, this has been great feedback. Yeah. Um, so Wrap it up. Take, take, yeah, taking taking the feedback, it seems like there's strong preference for just going that there should be a document, um, and we should take approach one in the document as opposed to two A or B. I forget which one is in the document now. Um, so next slide. We have yet maybe put this slide in. So it's not saying what the changes were, but we're going to like radically change it. And so I don't think we're ready for adoption. Let, but let's talk I think about that this there's a bit more. Consensus that this problem should be solved. We should have a document. Yeah. And I think the takeaway for the authors is to rework it for approach one. Anyone and, have concerns with that? And look into the the yeah and the protocol, exchange the protocol thing. Yeah. Whether, and, whether the protocols we'll and protocol yeah. like things are in there, or whether this is just focused on how do you embed tokens? But we'll, we've gotten some great feedback here around what to go forward with. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Great discussion. Yeah. This was, this was a good thing to have in person as opposed to email list. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dick. Appreciate it. Okay, awesome. George.
Do you do you want to control or do you want to drive me here? Uh, you can drive. Okay. Um, all right. So transaction tokens. Um, uh, thanks to a tool for doing pretty much all the work. Um, <laughs> Uh, so transaction tokens are something that I started thinking about uh, a while ago, and you can go to the next slide. Um, and largely, it, uh, it's around the context. There's probably two drivers for it. One of them is that generally the authorization domain that you have between your external client and your internal implementation, your internal backend, is different from the authorization with domain within the backend. So if you are trying to like take an OAuth token that you gave to a mobile app and use it as your authorization mechanism inside, you run in, into a whole bunch of problems. Um, so, so this was a way of how can you basically create a transition for something internal that um, can cover the, the, the life of that transaction. In the vast majority of cases, these transactions are relatively short lived. And um, you'll see some other sort of benefits here, but just to sort of set the stage, um, microservices from a backend perspective are not acid, right? And so trying to deal with rollbacks gets really complicated. So if you take a, an author, like an OAuth token from the client and every microservice is going back to the IDP, especially if that token is okay, because you didn't want the client to know anything about it and you're going back to the IDP, the, the chain could break in the middle. And it's unlikely that you actually want that transaction to fail once you've started it. Um, there probably are a few really small edge cases, like you know, person is purchasing a hundred million dollar you know ad campaign or something of that nature. Maybe you do want to check along the way before you do the final sort of like transfer. But the vast majority of our cases, if you start the transaction, you want it to complete. Next slide. So um, the other sort of key element here is that in the vast majority of implementation, once you get inside your internal network, the trust model is server to server. It's machine to machine trust and anything about the transaction just gets added as a parameter. And so the attack surface of a compromise of your internal service is much greater um, than if you can bind the context of the transaction into the token that's happening internal to your network. Um, so that's kind of the, the, you know, an attack surface benefit, you know, you reduce the attack surface with a transaction token. Next slide. So, um, so basically this is sort of a covering that's, you know, some more detail on that exact uh, concept here. Um, we, you know, we can limit that. Uh, basically we can get a, a transaction to complete and we can limit the attack surface as long as we can sort of maintain the, Im the immutable aspects of the transaction itself or the context of the transaction as it passes through downstream systems. Good. Good. Okay. Um, and then the final thing here is that um, at least uh, when I started working on this, the environment we were in um, was incredibly high load. And so, you know, the latency impact of going back to the to some service to validate a token is just not viable. So there's benefit in basically separating the kind of a token you use internally from the kind of a token that you use externally, because then if tokens are compromised, you can't use them in the other domain, right? You can use them if you compromise an OAuth token, you know, assuming it's not sender constrained, um, you, you can use that at the external side, but you couldn't use that internally or vice versa. You can't capture something internally, right? And use it at the external endpoint. Um, so, so you sort of reduce the service there and then you get that benefit of once you've started the transaction, every service in the, in the chain can process it locally. Um, and depending on how you structure the data in the token, you can actually do some level of coarse grain to finer grain. Um, authorization in the application that's receiving the transaction token. So what are they? Oh, this is the newer one, but it doesn't matter. Uh, so we changed that from being an OAuth token to a short-lived signed JWT. The, the key point is that, you know, if it's a new token type, it's probably, it could be a JWT, likely signed, but 
not do you want, technically an OAuth token. That was the only want, change we made. Do you want to ask what? Oh, okay. No, okay. No. That's fine. That was the only change in, in okay. it. So the, okay. um, but that, just calling that out um, here for that. Uh, context, um, if you're, you know, uh, so just to give some explicit examples, um, if you're receiving inbound mail, right, you kind of want to bind the email address to which the inbound mail is sent into some sort of into this transaction token so that all aspects of the of the internal system can effectively step closer to the mic and, and yeah okay um all aspects of services that are processing that um that request for the inbound mail can only do so in the context of the email address to which it was assigned right so if you make that immutable into the transaction token then the downstream services can't replace it and if someone were to compromise some service in the middle they can't basically you know just add a different email address um into the request and basically shove it in a different direction um a, an attacker in the middle would have to sort of sit there and wait for the appropriate transaction token to come along that has the email address they care about before they could potentially do something different with it um so we have the next slide is a little bit about what what one could look like um you know, it looks a bit like a job other than the subject identifier. Um, this is um, out of the, the shared signals. For, um, the subject ID, isn't that the yeah, structure? It's, it's not without shared signals, and it's actually... Microphone. Yeah. Microphone. Microphone. Use the mic. Atul Trichiba Kuali. Um, so the subject identifiers are no longer in the shared signals draft. They're now an IETF, almost an RFC. Like it's, it's okay, about on to its be own. published. As like okay. A, yeah. The second token. Yeah. So, so that, that sort of changed there. Um, and then there's sort of this authorization context. Um, I think it's important to note that the authorization context, you know, should, you know, can contain, um, context about the transaction itself. So if you wanted to stick things in there like a device identifier or some other thing about the client that made the external request, you could do so. You can also have authorization specific data. You know, whether we need to structure it as flat or whether we need to separate out authorization details separately, I think there's a bunch of interesting questions there. Um, it's possible that some of that authorization details is needed at a leaf um, at a leaf node or, or you know, leaf uh, microservice and other services shouldn't see it. So then does it need to be encrypted? So there's a whole bunch of open questions here. This is sort of like just trying to get some ideas down on paper to get a, a conversation started. Um, but this is, you know, this kind of a thing could then just be passed from one service to the next service. Um, it doesn't alleviate the need for um, that you're basically your machine to machine trust, you know, whether that's MTLS or, or some other sort of mechanism that you're using, you know, Spiffy, there's Athens.io, um, you know, but this then becomes a, a key element that you wouldn't be able to invoke the next downstream service without one of these. And that way you can chain the piece. A side benefit, maybe, maybe all of your systems um, do this super well, but I have seen many a back end where understanding the set of services a transaction goes through to, in order to complete is kind of undefined. So um, having something like a transaction ID in here that everybody can log because this thing's required to complete the transaction actually starts to give you some of that flow, you know, the, the service flow kind of data, which your cyber people will be super excited about um, if you don't have it. All right, lots of questions, Justin. Uh, so I can actually wait till you're done with the slide because. I think pretty much covered. Okay, uh, so my question is about the, uh, the AZC section. Is that uh, intended to be namespaced or, uh, or fixed claims or Wild West or what, what's the intent with that object? Great question. I think that there's probably some set of claims that are you know, potentially generic that you could, right. you know, be fixed mm -hmm. and a lot of extensibility. Um, Atul and I have been talking and, and other people in Peter, right, about if they're like, should, should 
like transaction context information, like <laughs> let's say user agent or device fingerprint or something right, of right. that nature be separated from, let's say, you know, transaction details or authorization details. When I originally looked at this, when you would, as you'll see in the next couple of slides where you go get one, mm -hmm. the concept was you could ask, you could basically pass in a RAR structure and it would get embedded mm -hmm. into the transaction token. Um, we haven't really got quite that far yet okay. in the okay. spec. All right, thank you. That's helped. Uh, Tobias, so just to understand this, transaction token is for like a boundary service, like an API gateway would take an external like OAuth token and then call an internal sort of service to create one of these that then is carried through the internal service call or like where does, this isn't an external token in a sense, right? This isn't something that a, like a boundary client would have. Yeah, so this would be, this is at least initially intended to be you know, internal to one trust domain. Right. Um, so yes, you could do it at gateway. That's a very so, sort of normal place to put it. But like in my inbound mail case, it's not really the gateway that's the inbound mail service, right? It may be the actual mail application itself. Sure. Right, that starts it. But, but you know, as close to the edge as possible is when you would want to make the transition. Right, so it's, it's, it's basically the boundary of the trust domain is where yes. this would get generated and then carried through. Yes, Okay. that's cool. the concept. Thanks. So um, it, I wonder how, how close this is to the sec, sec, set tokens. Are you using the sub ID from sec events? Essentially? <laughs> from share things, yeah. Yes. But you're looking at the structure, you could you probably look at the set token format and kind of treat that as a kind of an, an essentially a, that's an, this is an application of the security event token format, or it could okay. be, I mean, yeah. it, it's fairly close. I mean, do you have a transaction ID already specified in there and you know, you have an, a set of events, right? In which has the extensibility for you, your, your, your context, right? Okay. It's not yeah. actually that far. Cool. Uh, yeah, I think that's a great suggestion and we should have thought about this because I'm using sets in other specs that I'm working on. So, um, yeah, yeah, it, it does look like a set. So I don't think yeah. there's any additional work there. It's just yeah. what we call it. Right? So. Yeah, no, that, that's great. All right, let's go to the next slide. Um, this is just sort of a, a little bit of a comparison and, you know, to leap in a tool's point, if we move to sec tokens, it might change again. Um, the, the key probably point here really is that this kind of a token is sort of short-lived and there is no sort of associated access token or refresh token or any of those kinds of things attached to it. it it's, you know, meant to be something for the purpose of the transaction. Dick. Hi, Dick Hart. Uh, maybe I wasn't really paying enough attention to what you're talking about, but my understanding is these tokens are more of like a access authorization statement token than an event that you're talking about. Right, and so that would, that is, was not the intent of SEC event, which is here's a piece of knowledge, you can do something with it or not around something that happened, right? It's, it's intended to be, I did something letting you know that. And so I think moving it into SEC events would be distorting what uh, SEC events was created. For. So, but there may be good pieces of the way the, the you know, the JWT is structured for a SEC event that, sure. is, that is applicable in this space, right? So. No, no, no agreement on that. But to call it a security event, I think would be a abuse of what security events were because it's not a security event. Got it. From what I understand, unless I'm missing. No, no I, yeah, it's not, not technically a security event in the context that SEC events are defining security right. events. Okay. Yes. Is there a two clarification question? Oh, Christina. Um, are you looking to standardize only the format of a token or also how obtaining this transaction token based on the externally incoming thing? Is the so, first question? Yes, there is, there is a protocol element here, okay. um, which is like on the next slide. Oh, okay, okay. Who's coming? Okay. Yeah. And the second question was, and I'm sorry if you explained, but what, what was the motivation to have an object for the subject identifier? 
because like, in different contexts, I've heard a lot of questions like why Jot subject claims a string and not an object? Why can't we have multiple subjects? And it's surprising that it hasn't been defined, but it hasn't been. So I don't know, maybe it is beneficial to leverage this draft to define it, but like, why now and what's the motivation? So, so I think this was just, I mean, the, a, the, the subject value itself is a little bit cleaner in this kind. Like if in one context, it could be an email address and another context, it could be a UUID in another context, it could be, you know, some external reference or, or whatever. Um, that in that context, right, having, having a, a format and a, and a value is slightly cleaner than just basically overloading the string that is sub. Um, whether there are use cases where the inbound request has multiple principles um, is an interesting question. I haven't run into any of those personally. That doesn't mean they don't exist. So um, I think that's you know a, a potential feedback. But in the majority of cases where you're even in a machine to machine kind of scenario, you potentially don't really you know the 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 identifier of the entity making the request, which is sort of what this is intended to m represent is still singular. Right, um, thanks, that, that helps. I think if we go the path of defining subject as an object, I could see it being misused, not misused, but already, you know, reused in other contexts, so probably be aware of that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Atul Chibakuli. I just wanted to answer um, or, you know, comment on Dick's question that um, although I think we're not saying that this work should be moved to the sec events group or anything like that. It's just, we are leveraging the set. We could be leveraging the set spec, although the intent of that spec didn't cover things like the, this, which is not event driven. Uh, but I don't see any reason why we should not be doing it. Uh, we should not be referring to the SET spec as sort of, uh, you know, these transaction tokens could become sets essentially. As a format. Yeah, as a format. Okay. All right, just to get to Christine, is there anybody else in the queue? I can't see. Okay, Brian. Just one follow up second what Dick said. I think even referencing or trying to use a sec event as a format is terribly confusing and overloaded things that are already confusing. Yeah. So that I <laughs> okay. I would suggest not doing that. The the sub I Christina, I think maybe I'm wrong here, but the, the sub ID is defined in uh soon to be RFC as an object. So that's not being defined here, it's about to be out there somewhere, and this is just using, using it. it. Yeah. But conceptually speaking, isn't that it's out of second it, Yeah, it's in, our <laughs> it's in the queue, okay. But it, it really came about to provide sort of context of what kind of subject this is, to right, and this is the value of it. And in order to facilitate sort of understanding more of the context of the subject across domains, so it almost feels to me like a regular old sub or application specific way of identifying the principle is more appropriate in this internal context than than using the sec event stuff and I, I feel like the similarity to sec events was noticed because of that yeah, rather than an actual similarity to sec events in terms of the the context of use yep yep no no that very valid points i think i, I do think it's possible the, the one thing i do like about it is it is like like i said it's possible that the the entity that's starting the request does not necessarily have access to what would be your canonical internal identifier for a user. And so being able to basically say, hey, this is an email address and here is, and, the, and then the string is an email address can be useful for downstream systems that then need to go, oh, I need to, at this point, I need to go look it up. That's fair. It can be useful, but all this stuff is kind of application specific about who has access to what and how our subjects represented and it's a nasty world to try to define or, structure on that. Potentially, but I think that by giving the, the aspect of sort of 
you know, a format and a string, there's at least a little more very a little more extensibility for an application to define it well within their system and their use cases than just a pure string. But yeah, I, it's, it's valid. It's valid feedback. That's a Thank fair you. point. Yeah. All right. uh, Tobias, I I just want to make an observation. There's been some um, some interesting engineering blogs in the past that talk to one of the values of these sorts of models. It's not just about the fact that the uh, the external token of the client is kind of inappropriate for all sorts of reasons, as you highlighted. But one of the other main benefits that I think is uh, probably important to highlight in this work is rationalizing um, when you have an API service that might be using several different authorization schemes, right? You might be using cookies, you might be using API keys, access mm -hmm. tokens, everything at the boundary. And this is actually a way to rationalize what could be a really complicated external authorization model into a consistent transaction. Yes. And so I just think it's like a value proposition for this model. That's a yes. really important thing to sort of call out is Great what is one is, you yeah, know, could it, be, could be many different models. Yeah, no, it's a really great point. You you simplify the internal the, the the life of the internal developer because they only have to worry about one thing, and you can abstract the complexity of a bazillion other stuff on the out on the, at the edge. Absolutely. So okay. I think yeah we're at time. Do you, so do you wanna, let me yeah. let me just say this was the piece to Christina's point about about sort of protocols, right? The ability of the API gateway to go to some server. Um, it's, it's basically a profile of the token exchange um, to basically say, here's the data I want, issue me a transaction token, right? So that the downstream services know that, hey, they're, they're trusted authorization server to Justin's point on one of our last calls. You know, it, it functioned as, an op as like an authorization server with one purpose, right? To issue these kinds of tokens, allowing the, the internal network, the internal services to be able to trust the signature of this transaction token as it comes through. Um, it also allows for some level of meta authorization policy to be issued. Like, you know, is this particular, you know, API service allowed to request a transaction token with these constructs in it, right? And so you can put some authorization metadata there or some authorization, some meta authorization policy there as well. Um, uh, none of that's in the draft yet, right? So, you know, this you know, we got like the very first bit of a draft, um, you know, so obviously lots of feedback um, uh, appreciated. And um, the next two, I, I'm not gonna go over the slides, but there's two more sort of concepts in here that um, I think is, are more questions. Um, go to the next one. The, um, one of them is sort of like, should you be able to nest these transaction tokens in some way? And is that a self-signed by some microservice or do you have to go back to the token service to get it embedded or not? I think this is a, you know, is this valuable? Is this not valuable? This is, I think, an important question. And then the, um, to, to the work that Justin's been doing about um, whimsy and chaining and, you know, if, if you want to have sort of like a signed mechanism of, of proof of chain, right? And you're trying to do that in this kind of an environment, then these things could get really big. So at some point, should you be able to, you know, sort of like collapse them? Or in, if you saw Justin's uh, environment, when you're starting to cross domain boundaries, right? Should you be able to collapse what had been an internal one into some other representation that then goes to the next, you know, the next trust domain boundary and Peter, I think it's going to talk about, you know, sort of crossing trust domain boundaries next. Um, so there's probably overlap in how these things interact with each other, but this was sort of, I want, you know, we, we wanted to get sort of like an initial draft and this concept, you know, more structurally presented than we have in the past. Um, and then, you know, get feedback as, you know, do we take this forward? Is this, you know, worth like standardization? Is it another best practice document? You know, where do we go from here? So thanks. Thanks. Um, Justin, you wanna, yeah. go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'll be quick. Justin Richer, um, so it, I'm very much in favor of us doing something, something with transaction tokens. I do want to encourage the working group to not conflate uh, sort of the utility of a, like sort of a nice internal token like this with sort of a larger structure of carrying a bunch of these through the system, especially the chaining and all of that other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the more use cases that uh, I've been looking into 
recently, I'm more and more convinced that that a token is actually not necessarily the right structure for this. You know, the, I, I think that in this working group, we have a tendency to think with the tools that we have. And uh, I think that, um, that we need to be careful to not overfit the stuff that we're doing to this. The transaction tokens, I think is great. People have been doing this stuff for years. Let's, mm -hmm. let's figure out something, something to do this with this. And this, I think, is, uh, then becomes a piece of a larger puzzle to solve these uh, these other systems, like the cross-domain stuff that Peter's going to talk about, the stuff that we're going to be discussing in Whimsy and yeah. uh, and all that other stuff. So, Great. Awesome. just Thank context. You. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Okay, Peter. You want to drive or? Let's see. Okay, um, do I have control? Yeah, I think so. Oh, I do. Okay, uh, thanks everybody for being here this morning. Again, always a privilege and um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about identity chaining across trust domains. Uh, so this is a, a couple of folks that have been. Um, oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple of folks of us that have been sort of uh, thinking about this uh, in uh, parallel with the uh, uh, um, transaction tokens that we just talked about as well. Um, of course, customary Dolly generated San Francisco picture uh, because I didn't bring my camera. And uh, so I think we're going to talk a little bit about identity chaining, uh, why we need it, uh, sort of a, a, a proposed approach. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's in the draft and what we're going to do or, or what we should do next. Um, okay, first thing. Oh, format error. Um, Okay, so uh, also uh, you may recognize some of these pictures. So I want to just credit Justin for letting me borrow uh, some of his whimsy um, uh, graphics. Uh, so typically what we were just talking about, the transaction token uh, in these environments allows us to have some sort of information about, you know, when we get to the, uh, you know, second, third, fourth uh, service um, down the line, we get to find you know, we need to still know who was the resource owner, uh, what authorizations did they grant. Uh, we also want to know what other entities were involved uh, and also what other authorizations um, uh, they might have. And so, um, however, things get a little bit more interesting because these transactions are not always confined to a single trust domain. That trust domain can be between organizations, it can be within organizations. For example, your engineering department and finance department uh, may actually operate separate domains for reasons of compliance and trust. Uh, but this can also span across multiple organizations uh, as well. And, and so uh, the question then becomes, right, so if we have this situation where we have all these uh, multiple uh, services, um, we still need uh, to be able to answer the same questions when we get into a different domain. We still want to know who the original resource owner was, uh, what authorization they granted, uh, what other entities were involved, and also what authorization they, um, uh, they have along the way. And so to do that across trust domains, that's kind of what we're looking at um, here, right? And uh, also, I think in this world, we're sort of assuming there's another authorization server involved as well. So uh, these are, at least there's compatibility at that level, right? We have two domains that are using OAuth. So some, uh, some of the concepts, um, and uh, again, I want to thank sort of several people that sort of contribute to this um, as well. Brian, I think you and I have spoken about some of this uh, a while back. Um, uh, and so essentially, the sort of a three-step process uh, as we think about it, right? So first, the really, uh, if you're in domain one, you know, the, the uh, client in domain one exchanges a token. Uh, to get an authorization grant so that they can access the authorization server in trust domain two. Um, they then use this authorization grant uh, to get an access token, and then they present their access token to the resource server, right? So that's a fairly straight, 
for, for, uh, forward process, and it involves two existing um, uh, standards that we already have. So we've got token exchange for the first one, and then uh, reusing the assertion framework. Uh, so if we go back to our pictures, it sort of looks like this, right? There's a client, uh, that, and we'll talk more about but that client can be, uh, take, uh, it can be one of the resource servers, it can be the authorization server, but essentially first it obtains this authorization grant, uh, then they present it to the authorization server in the second domain, and once you obtain that, uh, you can access um, through. And in the first model, that client can be a resource server. So the resource server becomes a client and acts in this way. Uh, and then there were cases um, that people, uh, that we talked about specifically, I think um, Kelly uh, sort of pointed out that, uh, that there are scenarios where the trust is only between the authorization servers. So uh, the uh, resource server in domain one, uh, you would not necessarily want them to directly interact with an authorization server in domain two. And, and so in that case, uh, essentially the authorization server sort of talks to itself, gives itself some, self an authorization grant, uh, uh, get the access token from authorization server two, returns it to the resource server and presents uh, the access token. So that's kind of the, um, the outline. Um, so quickly, just what, what's in the draft, right? So I think we, there's a, a description of uh, a profile of these two things. Uh, we decided to go with a generic description and then in the appendix, we had the two sort of use cases, one resource server acting as client and the second one where the uh, authorization server uh, acts as a client. So both of those are described. Um, you know, a little bit about the token exchange profile piece. Uh, I think we wanted to sort of continue to have the token type uh, be agnostic. I think we got some feedback on maybe we want to restrict that uh, instead. Um, you know, I think that's a, very open to any comments, feedback on that. Um, and then both uh, uh, the resource and audience uh, parameters there uh, being required. Uh, a search and flow profile, I think um, this one, um, again, just, uh, I don't think there's anything, uh, just sort of being specific about the grant type and the assertion and so on, um, uh, that uh, you know, I think in the original, it sort of says you have to define, if you're going to profile this search and flow, you have to provide some additional details. So we've put that in. Um, Another thing that's kind of interesting is this idea of claims transcription. So one of the things that happened when you cross the uh, trust domains is that the first thing is that the subject identifier may be different in the different domains. And so somebody has to map it and somebody has to uh, maintain that mapping. And so we, we sort of, uh, again, if folks have thoughts on this or uh, guidance or if there are other solutions out there, it'd be good to know about. But that's one of the things that we would uh, we sort of outline is you, know, you want to you know, you need to maintain that that uh, that mapping, and when you're doing these, um, when you're crossing these trust domains, uh, you you may want to include that uh, and and move that forward. There's sort of a form of selective disclosure maybe in there as well. So, the authorization server may actually want to remove some uh, some claims, um, uh, or uh, you know, um, maybe even sort of add some things as well. Um, and then similarly with scoping, right? So there's really sort of changing the identifier, selective disclosure, and then also down uh, controlling scope or down scoping to, uh, so that you can have least access. Um, okay, in terms of, well, I think in terms of sort of next steps, right, there's a, already a bunch of open issues. And again, I really want to thank Brian for giving us a sort of a, a bunch of really good uh, feedback already. And, um, I think some of the open issues, right? One question is, do we want to limit format specifically to JAW tokens? Um, you know, what should we do about transcribing claims? Is there some specific, do we need to define that? Or, or do we, you know, what should we do about that? Um, and there's also in the case of the authorization server in domain one acting as the client, there is a question about whether there should be an additional profile uh, for token exchange between the resource uh, server in domain one and the authorization server in domain one. At the moment, we don't think we need that, but it's sort of a, it's one of the open issues that, that we haven't addressed. 
Um, and then I think sort of a, a bunch of other uh, comments, I think, uh, where we were either unclear uh, or used bad formatting or, or bad practices uh, that, that needs to get cleaned up. So some work left on that, but um, uh, also if folks have more comments, very, very happy to hear about those. So that's kind of, oh, did I skip one? Um, so yeah, I think for next steps, I, if there's any general feedback on the approach that we're taking, uh, also in terms of interest in this working group, right? To pursue this as a problem that, you know, is this something that, a problem that other folks have? Uh, is it useful to pursue this work? And then also, is this something that we should pursue in this working group? Um, I think, and, and just sort of as an early indicator uh, on, on this. I think that's everything that I have. Thanks, Rafael. Okay, thanks, Peter. Anybody has any thoughts about this? At least um, at at the level of the problem that we're trying to solve here. So I we've heard from Justin. He seems to be in favor of doing something like this, addressing that space. But other ideas, other thoughts. Hi, um, Ori Steele. Uh, the there there's a part of the cross trust domain interaction model that you have that looks really, really similar to a lot of the conversations that the skip folks have been having regarding federated transparency uh, service interactions. So I'm, I don't want to get into all the details around transparency service federation because it's a long topic, but there are a lot of folks that are interested in collaboration around these sort of I'm my transparency service controls my tra my trust domain. Your transparency service controls yours, but transparent statements from mine are a, an input to yours because software supply chains are you know tightly integrated systems where often many organizations need to control their boundary, but they also have dependencies that cross organizational boundaries, and there's traceability and security issues that also follow as that happens. So. Um, maybe a longer conversation at some point with the skip folks might be helpful. Okay, thanks, Ori. That, I, I didn't think about that as an application. Thank you. Anybody else? Brian. Uh, in, for better or worse, I'm partly responsible for the assertion series of grant drafts as well as token exchange. And uh, I've... It, this kind of thing is a recurring problem, recurring ask. I've seen it a lot for many, many, many years. Um, I've always envisioned the assertion grants as the cross domain mechanism and the token exchange as being more of the local exchange to facilitate getting the right thing to go cross domain. It's always been kind of the way I thought about it. It seems people, consumers of these work products don't see it the same way and have tried to do things that are problematic or unnatural or just don't quite work in the context of token exchange. So I, I think there is probably value in writing down something like this to try to clarify how, how it was more or less intended to be used. Um, some of the pieces that you're building on have their problems and aren't perfect and apologies for that. But this, this kind of clarity and clarification I, I think is, is worthwhile. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Okay, anybody thinks it's a bad idea, should not be working on this? Okay. Okay, okay. I think you got good feedback. I think let's That's build cool. on this, right? Yeah, and brilliant. Thanks everyone. Okay. And um, yeah, uh, feel free to reach out if you have more comments or you can take it up on the list as well. Awesome, Thank thanks you. Peter. Okay, Aaron. short one. Okay, here we go. Um, hi, Aaron Parecki from Okta. Um, I have the you, you have slides. It. Do I do I have to reload it again, huh? Now let's try again. Let me try it again. 
Did you reload? I just reloaded. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Um, OK, so this is an update on the conversation we had last time at uh, ITF 116, where we were discussing the state of OAuth in native apps, particularly the mobile apps. So quick recap of what we see in mobile apps is um, the kind of prompt for logging in with whatever provider. And if you do things properly, uh, following the current RFC for recommendations for mobile apps, the uh, phone will use the appropriate API to do this sort of in-app isolated browser where you're not leaving the app. So you're not like switching out of the app like it used to be a long time ago, but you still get this first prompt of, um, this is from the, from the operating system, showing you the domain that you're about to go uh, log in at, at which point the little browser pops up um, where you can see the address bar and the lock icon, which is an intentional design decision. Um, and this is where you log in. And this, this website, this web page is not visible to the app, the native code in the app. The website is isolated from the app, so the app cannot look at the password field. And the, um, that means it can actually share system cookies if you are already logged in in the browser on the phone. It can share the cookies and you're already logged in here. So overall, it's been a lot of, this has been a lot of you know, years in the making of making this experience as good as possible while also protecting from protecting the um, making so the app cannot actually observe anything going on in the login page. And this is obviously very desirable for the case of a third party app using a different identity provider to log in. So we can even go so far as to do, you know, multi-factor auth and using web authn and, and um, origin bound credentials and stuff. So it's, it's great. Um, and then eventually you'll get back here and this is where the app is exchanging the authorization code for the access tokens. So there's usually a little spinner or a little moment where you're waiting for the login process to finish. This is good for third party applications. It's that, you know, you get the good isolation, the app can't uh, see anything that's going on inside the, with the authorization server. You can take advantage of an existing session you might have and it supports strong multi-factor. However, in the case of people building first party applications, uh, this is a not desirable experience and people want a better user experience. And people are currently finding very clever ways to avoid doing what we have always recommended, which is opening that browser in apps. They are doing their own DIY authentication schemes and just not using OAuth at all. Um, they are using the password grant from OAuth. They are um, OAuth servers that want to actually facilitate this will have created proprietary APIs to support direct authentication from the mobile apps. And my favorite one is this last one where the app developer will open that authorization server page in a hidden web view, put a password field in the app, and then try to inject that password into the hidden web view, pretending like none of this is even happening, um, which then, of course, breaks as soon as you try to do multi-factor. So uh, this is kind of the state of things, and it's kind of a mess, and it's um, uh, clearly a problem. Um, John, did you have a question about this? Oh, Okay. <laughs> Get ready. Man. Fair enough. Okay. So, uh, all of these things are frankly worse than um, the worse security outcomes than using OAuth the way that the native apps best practice says to use OAuth. Uh, however, people don't want to do it. So, I'm going to put a pause in that. And now I want to tell you about the authorization code flow for web applications. Forget mobile now for a second. We're in a browser. You're writing a server-side application. Uh, so you have server-side server, server -side code that's running. And how does the OAuth flow work? Well, the client application, which is on the server, uh, starts the flow by redirecting the user's browser to the authorization server. That's RFC 6749. It includes a client ID, scope, code challenge, all that stuff. Uh, and, the next thing that that client sees is the user is back at the redirect URL of that application and there is now an authorization code there. And then it can exchange that authorization code for a token. Cool, that's great. Well, what happened in between? In between, 
is all of the stuff that is, quote, out of scope of OAuth. That's how does the user log in? How do they authenticate? What kind of multi-factor do you do? What kind of consent uh, gathering do you do? What kind of registration flows or recovery flows? All that stuff has to happen, and it does happen, but the app doesn't see it. It's all stuff that happens between the browser, the user agent, and the authorization server. So what this means is when someone wants to implement OAuth, as, an, as in an authorization server, they have to read the, auth the authorization code flow spec, and they say, here's how a client will start the flow, and here's how I issue an authorization code, and then they have to figure out what to do in the middle. And they have to write a bunch of code that ends up being proprietary, uh, intentionally, that deals with actually authenticating the user and um, doing all, that, all those other steps that are not defined in OAuth. And that was obviously the design goal with OAuth was to separate those two concerns, uh, which great, works great in the web world. So if we try to bring this to the world of native apps, we can actually do something that's very similar, where we could define a framework that looks exactly like the authorization code flow, except not in a web browser, where it starts the flow, and then undefined things happen between the authorization server and the app that are the business of that authorization server. And the flow ends by the authorization code being issued. <coughs> so this is what we have done in this new draft that uh, we put together. So, so, so this question, if you go back. Yep. So when you say this, are you talking about the blue side or the dot? The blue arrows, the stuff yeah. that is okay. Parallel to the authorization code flow for web apps right, right. is the new draft that we've put together. Got it. Um, yeah. that, and that's the part that's in scope of that draft. Yeah. So this, the goals here are reuse as much of the OAuth building blocks as possible, as in um, try to make sure we can leverage all of the existing stuff in OAuth where it makes sense. Mirror the web web based authorization code flow, defi defining how the client starts and ends the flow, but leave the specifics of how the user authenticates up to the business of the authorization server so that it is continues to be the proprietary authorization server specific flow like it is right now in the web server example. Um, in the future, we could define an extension that says here's how you do passkey authentication for mobile in the context of this uh, authorization code flow for mobile apps. And I think that would be a, gr a great extension to do. Um, we could also do that for web apps. No reason we couldn't, right? Maybe there is benefit to do, doing it in the web world as well. I do think that benefits are a little bit more concrete in the mobile case, but it's, we, we, we have the same gap in websites in the web right now. Um, so. Has anybody read this draft, by the way? One, two, well, you helped write it, so I hope you would have read it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, a couple. Um, so the core thing that this draft does is it defines a new endpoint. We're calling it the authorization challenge endpoint. And this is meant to be the native apps version of the authorization endpoint. In the authorization code flow, the authorization endpoint is um, an endpoint that the user agent will be redirected to in order to for the user to then do a bunch of stuff there that's not defined in the spec. So same idea, but now it's a new endpoint because this endpoint accepts post requests from the app. Uh, basically, anything that would have been sent in the query string as a, as a get to the authorization endpoint is now sent as a post parameter to the authorization challenge endpoint, including any extensions that are defined anywhere in OAuth. So Pixie resource indicators, OpenID Connect stuff, whatever, like anything that you can extend on the authorization endpoint, you can also extend here. Uh, so it, the client starts the flow by making this post request saying, hey, I'm trying to log in. And then uh, the spec doesn't say what happens next other than you get back an error code saying something that you can define. And you get a little um, handle that, uh, which we we'll have to rename it for reasons, but there you get a little handle that you can use to keep coming back to this endpoint until eventually you get back an authorization code. And this is another important distinction. Like this is meant to return an authorization code so that it mirrors the web authorization code flow, not a token here. Because 
if you want to slot this into an existing implementation of an authorization server, you already have a way of creating an authorization code and then you have a token endpoint and the token endpoint has all the validation logic for how do I know whether it's okay to issue a token based on a bunch of stuff, which might include extensions to OAuth like proof of possession, uh, DPOP, and all that kind of stuff is already in the token endpoint. So we don't want to duplicate all that stuff in a new endpoint. So instead this endpoint returns the authorization code, which you can then take to the token endpoint, just like you would have if you had got it from a redirect. I know that part makes a lot of sense, but it, like on the flip side of it, when you're describing the initial stuff, the authorization code originally came as a construct to sort of bridge the gap between that browser redirect and coming back. So it's, uh, I, I get it. However, um, that is the world we're in now. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, let me see. The uh, okay. So yeah, on the token hold, hold endpoint. On. Dick. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, agree. It's the world we're in now, but it actually maps into how an implementation might have done a separation of concerns. And that the thing that issues the authorization code may not have the same permissions to issue a token, right? That the underlying infrastructure might be completely separate for security reasons. So I, I think it's a good approach. The uh, yeah, I, I agree with for that. that additional reason. I, um, I I agree with that. Like if you look at the the two endpoints in OAuth, the authorization endpoint and the token endpoint, they do completely different things now. One is handling user interaction and um, authenticating the user, and the other one is a token is outputted or an error is outputted. So what this means is we're not changing anything about the token endpoint in this spec. We're not creating a new place tokens come from. We're not making any changes to the token endpoint. The, the app just sends an authorization code that it got a different way to the token endpoint. OK. Yeah, OK. <laughs> um, Okay, you wanna wait you, on John or? What, uh, oh, I have a couple more. Sure, okay, go why, ahead. Why don't you finish the couple of slides then? I'll... Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, try not to interrupt. You. <laughs> so I, I guess we've already said some of this. So why is this a new endpoint? Uh, because so we can't use the current authorization endpoint, and the reason for not being able to use the current authorization endpoint is that that ha is specifically meant to be interacted with by a browser. It does not accept post requests from the OAuth client. And that means that there's actually a lot of implementation logic that has gone into all the existing OAuth servers that may, might even go so far as to block post requests from a client or things like that, or like ensure it's being interacted with by a browser, by a user agent, looking for user agent strings, using, doing other kinds of things. That's all like, again, this is a proprietary endpoint the only thing that's defined on it is the beginning and the end of it. And a lot of people have done interesting things to try to make sure that it is used that way. Um, and we have got some initial feedback from people that they are not willing to change that logic to return JSON data. Like that endpoint always returns HTML because it's meant to go into a browser. People don't want to modify that to conditionally change it to then output JSON instead. So that's the reason for doing this as a new endpoint. Um, Okay, so a couple other things that this spec defines. Do you want to add to that? If, yeah, I just adding yet another supporting that the hello implementation, it's not even a server endpoint. The authorization endpoint is actually a spa. Huh, yeah, right. Okay, good point. Uh, not the first time I've seen that. So excellent. Um, the other thing that this draft does is it defines a new error response at the token endpoint, which um, is optional, but it's a way to for the token endpoint to indicate that uh, the user needs to go and start to, to start a new collection, new authorization session again. That's essentially meant to to let the um, authorization server on a refresh token request say, actually, no, I want the users to log in again. So go collect whatever we need again. Uh, and the other thing it does is on resource server, it also adds a similar error response of, um, uh, sorry, it doesn't add it, but you can add, you can use the resource server error response to also indicate that you need to go start a new session. Um, so for example, using the step up draft. 
Um, so that would be the two other endpoints that the app is going to interact with of you know, using refresh tokens at the token endpoint, using access tokens at the resource server, and you may want to be able to force the user to start a new session, a new authorization session again. So you have the option of doing that uh, with these error responses. Um, OK, TBD device session is the term that right now you'll see in the spec for that uh, string that is able to, the phone's able to use to tie together the whole back and forth transaction, which eventually will get an authorization code. It's not a good name. We need to change it to something because it's not really meant to be a persistent device identifier. So we should change it. Um, something like authorization request ID or transaction or whatever it is. Uh, but the concept of it is the same. Uh, and the, the other thing that we want to be able to add is a jumping out point to be able to have the authorization server say, I know you want to do a native flow, but actually we really do need the user in a browser right now for whatever reason. So how do we enable popping out to the web when needed? An example of that would be um, you are starting with like a pass key and the, the phone has, has collected that challenge and sent it up and then the server says, actually we need like a second factor that you don't have the ability to collect natively because it's something special to the AS or it is a whatever it is. Um, so ideally that would enable, we would be able to uh, bounce out to the web, but keep the context of whatever's happened already. So it's not like starting a new OAuth flow from scratch. We wanna be able to carry the context of whatever's happened in the flow up until now, bounce out to the web, and then it continues on like an OAuth flow from there. Um, and then the other thing that we've heard a lot of is that people want to do FIDO OAuth grants. People want to exchange a FIDO credential for access tokens. It seems like this is the place to do it. Um, again, we don't want to define that in the core spec. This is meant to be the, the bookends, kind of like the web authorization flow, but there is an opportunity for someone to define how that works in particular to fill in that middle chunk of uh, here's how we take a FIDO credential and turn it into an authorization code using this framework. Hey, John, would you like to tell us how we can do that? <laughs> I, would, I would love to tell you how to do that if I knew the answer. Okay. Now, more people are asking me that question almost on a daily basis. I have a call this afternoon with the financial regulator in Brazil who wants to know exactly that. Um, Let's step back a second to something lovingly called BCP 212. Um, I understand from our the the app auth BCP. Um, I do understand from our dutiful chair that it has come under some attack. Attack. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, I guess this is also an indication that some people are dissatisfied with that pattern, though. Um, for people like, say, oh, Okta, um, where you may have a native, first party native app like TripIt, we still, that BCP is what enables TripIt to go through Google to Okta to authenticate to enable employees to get into that app, which is an important pattern. Um, I'm, we need to, if we're going to introduce a new pattern, we need to make sure that we don't break federation and we don't break the ability to do web auth in. So I'm not necessarily opposed to a new pattern as long as we don't unintentionally, you know, as a side effect break things that are important to people. So let me back up a second. Um, and the, uh, I can't back up on the slides. So where do you or not? Which um, slide? And I don't remember where it is. Hold on. Point is, um, oh, the one that talks about breaking out to the web. It's like one or two back. That is an example of one reason you may want to force people to get out to the web. So, so in an enterprise case, I would actually expect this is never used. Because uh, again, the scope of this well, is first party. Well, app. except that first party apps do invoke enterprises as in the TripIt case. So is TripIt a first party app? In, under yes. this, un, in, the, in, the, in what we've described. So a lot of the draft is actually not the mechanics of this. There's 
a good half of the text in the draft describes the scenarios in which this is appropriate to use. And that is not supposed to be one of the scenarios where it's appropriate. So right. it is so, because it is the authorization server is not TripIt. So, so I think we may need to, if we're going to introduce this new mechanism, we may need to actually update the BCP so that our advice about what you do with native apps includes this, includes updated Apple APIs. Yeah. I mean, it's not the worst idea. I mean, yeah. William Dennis and I wrote that five years ago. APIs have changed since then. No, it was not. Sometimes several times. It was almost 10 years ago. It was 20, 2014. Well, we started 2014, I think we finalized in 2017. Yeah. But then, so these ago. things take a long so, time to thin it. But maybe, maybe it is time to update that Probably is. And this, this may, pro, having a new mechanism that could be included may be a reasonable trigger for that. So I, I think that it's important for people to understand when this would be appropriate and when it isn't, because that's actually, like somebody like TripIt or, I mean, Apple just freaking shot themselves in the foot the other day themselves with their first party app on Android. People can no longer, people who have updated their security can no longer log in on Android. So, so actually, this, the, all of what you're saying is actually an argument for, a uh, strong argument for having the option for forcing the, out to the browser again for all those fallback yes. cases. So the TripIt so, example, let me, let me give you the TripIt example. TripIt has a, a web API, and they have their own authorization server for their own stuff. And yeah, then they do enterprise SSO. So if they wanted to launch this, if they wanted to use this pattern for their own application, people logging in with the TripIt password, then, you know, they just, they follow this, these steps. If they want to then add an enterprise SSO connection, they would use the bounce out to web option for those customers, for that user. Once, once we get to that point, they're like, oh, I can't mm -hmm. do, I can't go any further natively on the native app. So I'm going to now bump out to the, the web redirect option and finish it there. So since you've up volunteered to help me update the BCP, <laughs> I'm willing to help you make sure that this works as well as it can. And okay. yes, I think we also need to think about where we do the work to have um, include web auth and information in JOTS. There's two different cases, one which is as the client authentication, the other is providing evidence of a user authentication as part of another backend interaction. So there's kind of two two proofs that I see people people wanting. So figuring out where and how we do that would be a good thing. I don't know whether it's this spec or another spec. Yep. Okay. Good. Well, John, you are on the record, so. <laughs> uh, <not the> <laughs> we have a volunteer. So, uh, yeah, and I'm I'm gonna drag you guys, you and and uh, Aaron, for that discussion with the with oh, the guy. I already arranged a call for you. Great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> George. Yeah, this is just a quick comment back to our discussion about token imp using the token endpoint with codes, and for me. Um, another reason to do that is the breakout to the web that you described, right? So that as an as a mobile app developer, right, I, whether I have to bounce out to the web or I don't have to bounce out to the web, the process of getting the tokens is the same, right? I get an authorization code, I submit it, as opposed to having two ways to get tokens. Yep. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Don't worry. Or, or you steal. Um, so the, the device device session to be renamed sort of flow. Um, I've seen uh, at least one API that implemented this sort of flow exact, well, maybe not exactly, but very close, similar sort of thing. They called it, they actually had two identifiers. They had, which I struggled to understand why they needed two, but they had a transaction identifier and a workflow identifier that were sort of together in the API. And you could get, you know, bounced around this loop going, you know, to different places, gathering all of these pieces up before you'd finally get to the end where you might be able to exchange something for, for a proper token. Um, and I'm, I'm not mentioning the API by name intentionally, but I'm happy to talk to you about it uh, outside. Um, yeah, that's it. 
yeah, definitely worth looking at other um, existing solutions that have done similar things. Uh, Tobias, and maybe this detail hasn't worked out yet, but <clears throat> when you bounce out, when you say bounce out to the web, is that supposed to be to finish the flow, or is that potentially an intermediate step, right? Because we talk about the the code before, I think it was kind of maybe <clears throat> to George's point. It sounds like it's implied that like if you were to bounce out to the web, that would be like your intent to finish the authorization, right? And you would get the code back. It wouldn't be like a Mm. A piece in the middle where you do some native app interaction, some web interaction, some native app interaction, and then complete the flow, right? The intent was if if you're bouncing out to the web, it's like the last resort because you can't get an authorization code from the native right. flow. And right. then the output of that would be the authorization code or error like termination can't continue. Right. And and I think you maybe touched on it, but there would probably need to be extensions to the authorization request to maybe carry some of that context through. Because if you're starting like a native app interaction. Yeah, yeah exactly. So it would be, uh, yeah, it would be an extension to the authorization code flow to pick up the session that you've got going natively yeah. and then start an authorization code flow with that. Right. Yeah. Hi, Justin Richer. Haven't read the draft yet, but I have opinions. I bet you do. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, seriously though, um, to, to follow on with uh, Tobias's point, um, I think that there is there's a need to be clear about whether the inverse of, of the error flow that you're talking about is also the case. So I try the web first and that dies. And so then I go to native. What is the use case you would imagine for that? Somebody thought it would be a good idea is the use case. So we need to be clear whether that's allowed. <laughs> yes. it, right, right. Fair. So we need to be, we need to be clear whether that's, that's an allowed fallback direction or not. I, under, I understand that this is that we have an intended directionality to it. That's the only one that makes sense to me too, but you know, I've seen people do weird stuff. Yep. Um, the, uh, the other part of this is that I think that with the extensions to the authorization uh, request and stuff like that, um, I'm really interested to see where something like this would align with PAR. Um, because if you're doing intent registration to set all of this stuff up, uh, then that can put you in a, in a place where you're not even ever going to the browser if you don't have to. I would imagine that, um, frankly, I would probably recommend you, uh, building on top of PAR for this, mm -hmm. uh, for that. But the output of PAR is a request URI that you take in a browser to continue to, to do the flow. It is today. And this as specified as best as I can tell is kind of another intent registration endpoint almost. This is, um, this is not a par endpoint because the par endpoint returns a request. I know the return is yeah. different. Exactly. So, but it does take all the same parameters that the par endpoint takes. That's, that's the point that I was raising. Yeah. So, um, whether this is something that subsumes par or something that sits I, alongside it. I don't know what the yeah. right answer is. I, that's a discussion that we need to have if we sure. pull this in. Um, sure. my, my instinct there was to not make an extension to par. Mm -hmm. uh, it could make an extension to par and make it a new response mode or something that par can switch off of, right? And then right. par endpoint either returns a request URI or this new stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that felt messier because it felt like more overloading. And if there are any existing if there's existing implementations of par then supporting this means building something next to it rather than modifying that mm -hmm. so that was kind of the idea it was like it's a separate thing next to it it's going to look very similar to par to the par endpoint except the uh, return value is different so right and it's also going to give me something that i can carry to an authorization endpoint yes which yes. is probably which, going to look a lot like a request you are right a lot like a request you are right yes. exactly so there's that's those alignments need to be figured out. I, I'm, I'm with you that I'm not sure it should be an overloading. Um, architecturally, it seems that it kind of is, kind, though, kind of, and I, of but is. I don't know which is less messy. Um, that's a good question. And uh, what we could do is write up, um, so one of the in, the, in the bottom chunk of the spec, there's mm -hmm. examples, and there's example um, user experience section, and there's example requests section. And uh, one thing we could do is write up uh, take those and then rewrite them as if they, as if it had been a par endpoint, right? And then right. see, like, okay, is this something that people can support alongside actual par? Right. Could and, I extend my par yeah. to also send back this other stuff or not? Yeah, I think that's the question. All right, thanks. 
Dick. Yeah, just on that comment, I, I, I like the idea that it's a separate endpoint than par because it's returning a different thing. Um, but it sounds like you're thinking that it could take a par request and return back. The, the, everything that we've, everything that you send in the first bit yeah. is the same as par. And then there's the unspecified proprietary stuff back and forth that's not part of this spec, which might be weird to shove into the par endpoint. Yeah. Right. But yeah. the beginning of it is the same. And then the output of it, the response is either an authorization code, a request URI, or the proprietary stuff. So it's, yes, it kind of looks like it. Could you kind of smush them together? Yeah, probably. Is that a good idea or not? I don't know. OK. I'm, I'm you could pass all the par stuff plus the extensions into the endpoint you're proposing. Yes. OK. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that that all became clear. I think that's a good idea. That's what okay. I was saying. <laughs> Mike. Thanks, Nick. Mike. Mike Jones, I think I support just what Dick said. My additional suggestion is, since this question came up here a few times, like write a section, which is a note to implementers saying, how is this like and different than par? Mm. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks Mike. Brian. Quickly to respond to Justin, what you would get back is a lot like a request URI, but not really. Like it's the request URI is con like the actual request parameters and context where I think you'd be getting back here is like a context identifier or whatever you're gonna call that well, the, session thing. But the, the value of the request URI is not defined. So no, the value of it, but it references the content of the original request. Which this would too. Or not, or whatever, whatever, it would be whatever transactional context that authorization yeah. server wanted to maintain at that point that I guess it decided I guess, to kick yeah, out. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's, it includes it's, more than the, just the request. And maybe less. Like, yeah. And you could have discarded that information. I don't know. I, I agree, though. I think the separation from par is there's a lot of things that feel like they could go together. Once you start doing it, it gets ugly, and I think okay. a separate endpoint is worthwhile. I had something else I wanted to say. First of all, I, I'm... I'm deeply ambivalent about trying to standardize this, so don't okay. take any of this as having said that, that whatever you're gonna, <laughs> sorry, whatever you're gonna call that device, I already forgot what it is, but. Transaction identifier. The transaction identifier. So when, when you kick out of the error, you get that identifier and you go back, right now it's defined to present it as a uh, you know, form encoded content right like yeah. the interaction with this is and that if this was to proceed and go off that's like placing a huge restriction on the actual api that this endpoint would want to offer for interacting with with the clients most people are going to want to do that you know with some sort of json based api sending json input yeah like, and I know OAuth does a lot of form encoded stuff and there's reasons for that, but like for something that's basically hmm. crafting a framework around what's gonna be a proprietary API. And par, does par, so par, par is a JSON request? No, no. par is no, okay, form encoded endpoints, but it did that for a couple of reasons. One was so it could take advantage of client authentication mechanisms, which are also form encoded. Um, so there was a lot of like old history and historical reasons that it, use form encoding to be compatible with existing constructs of the old framework and so forth that sort of just had to be. Um, but this is, you're, you're kind of, you're trying to allow for arbitrary custom API mm -hmm. interaction, but at the same time, forcing a content type on it that, mm -hmm. um, I see. that people will hate. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, people, there's, there's a lot of objection to the form encoding in the first place. There's good or bad reasons, but reasons to have it in OAuth. Here you have an opportunity to not do that. You just need to give some way to get that contextual identifier back and forth. So I don't know what the right answer is. Say how to do it in JSON, make it a header, something. But um, if and how this proceeds, that I really think that's got to change to be more that's a, flexible. That's a good point. Maybe, um, maybe putting it into a header is a, a way yeah, to push push the problem out of we're not we're not specifying the content type of your requests yeah because yeah. that's what 
that's what Depop does. And that's what Depop does. That's what it, I mean, it's kind of a cookie. That's what a yeah. cookie is. And it, but yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Don't worry. Oh, he, I'm um, Corey Steele. He's, he's basically said everything that I queued to say, but the, the reason that the API that I was discussing before has this dual identifier structure is, is specifically to address this kind of case where I start this flow off in some context that I'm trying to complete a mission that's complicated and I want to retain that mission. And the first response that I get is my transaction identifier that I then keep reusing until I complete the mission. And that particular API was implemented in JSON and sort of assumed very, very specific type of JSON um, was the only thing you would care about. So, so I, <clears throat> I would like to level up a little bit. Um, so the, the BCP, native apps BCP wasn't published that long ago. Uh, it was end of 2017, okay. and, and obviously there was a lot of uh, outreach and so on. And so I'm wondering what we could do to actually get a more feedback from others, because it feels a little bit like um, we've done the work, but then some part of the developer community either didn't agree with what was done or they didn't like it or whatever. Uh, it it leaves a little bit of bad days behind, to be honest. Uh, so I wonder whether we need to have more outreach. Maybe we talked to a lot of people, but uh, not saying that. And it was ongoing like for a number of years. And so, but still it's, it's weird that even so, after such a short period of time, there's this major gap, right? so major issue. In my, my understanding of the situation is that OAuth started just for third parties, like it's all over the spec. Like this is for third party apps, right? The mobile app BCP was also written in that context of it's gonna be used by third party applications. And there is no question that it is still the correct option for the third party app case and enterprise SSO. And anybody who's trying to argue that is wrong. And there's a lot of good reasons where we can spell out very clearly why. And uh, you cannot convince someone that they should do a native login, handle the user's passwords in a third-party application, right? Like, not a good plan. And now there's technical reasons why it won't work because of origin-bound multi-factor and stuff. So, cool. However, I think what ended up happening was people did start using OAuth and OpenID for first-party cases all over the place. And that's where this kind of breaks down because the attack vectors that we're talking about for third party apps don't apply in the first party case. And then developers look at OAuth and they're like, well, why do I have to go through this extra hoop if I'm just trying to open up my own authorization server? Like, I don't want my users to see this weird prompt that says I'm trying to sign in with the app domain and then they have to click five times to get through. Like, I just want to put a password form in my app, right? And I think that's really what started breaking that down. I, it, it sounds like a nice story, but I like from my recollection, like first party uh, use was a, was a topic uh, also like during that time. So it's not a, something that suddenly showed up in, in the last two years. Uh, no, no, it wasn't, so, so. <laughs> so it wasn't sudden, but it's a lot of the, a lot of the, the OAuth documents were still have been written in the context of third party primarily, even if everyone kind of knew that people are using it for first party stuff. Okay. But, no, if we can't do better, then that's, that's what it is. But, but if we can, if you guys have some ideas on what we could do differently this time, uh, I would like to hear about it. And I'm sure Rifa too. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, we are almost done. So, um, but yeah, uh, George and John. Yeah, I would so, just say, Hannes, that it's not developers, it's product owners, right? I, I've, it's not been since 2017, it's been before that, product owners, right? I want, the, I want to design my app. I want to design the look and feel. I want to yeah. design this stuff. I want the colors to match this. I want, you know, I don't, you know, if, if I bounce out to my SSO provider in the web, it looks different. And how do I make that look consistent? It doesn't feel right. It is 
you know, as developers, for the most part, we don't care, right? It's relatively easy. Open a browser, send it over there. I get a code, I'm done, right? But the product people really do care. And then it becomes yeah. us architects who have to like go in and try and give the security reasons and all these other reasons and try and explain why they actually should be doing it in a browser. And it's yeah. an, and I don't know that, you know, so you can make that argument and try and win and sometimes you win and sometimes you don't. Um, in this particular case, I think because we now have good ways to have assurance that I'm talking to a first party app we have the ability to, you know, allow for a better user experience. And I do think there, you know, um, the, the conversation that Bob Blakely started ages ago at Identiverse about recognition versus authentication, right? When you have a mobile app, you have a ton of signals, right? And so the ability to potentially let a user in for low value things without doing anything actually starts to become viable. Um, that you could do in this kind of a context, right? Still leveraging OAuth or OpenID Connect um, without actually having any user experience at all. Thanks, John. Uh, George, sorry. And <laughs> John, wrap it up here. Um, so I think George is right about the product owners. I think some of the developers are also slightly bitter that they can't use a web view to log into Google and a bunch of other places. Why? Because it's insecure. But it's not because the BCP doesn't let them. You know, Google, at the time the BCP was written, blocked web views being able to authenticate to Google before we actually finished publishing the BCP because it was insecure. Um, so there are some people that basically have the view I'm good, why should I have to jump through the hoops that try and stop the bad people? Because mm -hmm. the bad people are going to do bad things anyways. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, maybe we didn't do enough um, explanation in the BCP to say, yes, you as a relying party, if you're gonna have third party logins, don't allow them in web views. Maybe that wasn't clear enough. Um, you know, things like Pixie, which was in that BCP is now part of OAuth 2.1. Mm -hmm. People should still be doing Pixie. Yeah. You know, um, I think for the purely first party app use case, I think we do actually need to look at the grant types. Now that every mo freaking mobile device has pass keys, why aren't we just doing a pass key login and mm. as, a, as a simple grant type? We could make this, I mean, there may be use cases for this, but maybe there's an even simpler, more direct thing that we can do. Well, User logs in, back you, and forth and we're done. If you look at the examples there, right. like that's the intent is that right. it should be that simple for those cases. Like it's not meant to force you to do a 10 step back and forth collection of credentials. But only in the- It's meant to enable, I've got- so At some I've point I'll the, actually read it. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that if we do this, optimize for the very simplest case where every iPhone, Android phone, Windows phone, um, has uh, pass keys on it. If we can make it simple for the simple case where it is truly a first party app, because there is already native API that all these apps can use to get pass keys in the context of the app where it's first party, we don't have to deal mm -hmm. with all of those third party things, but still enable enterprise or these other apps, which you, know, you still have first party apps that are using login with Apple and various other things were actually breaking out to a browser so that they can do the appropriate authentication is essential. So getting apps to understand the various levels and reasons why they need to do things. So I think this could be an important piece of modernizing it, um, but we're still always gonna have people who complain. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, great. You, you got lots of great feedback. There is more work to be done here. There is lots of interest, so uh, which I, is great. All yeah, right. I guess that means do we do we should we ask for adoption of the draft? It before? seems to me a little bit premature okay. right now. So let's talk. You talk with with John Possible. and see.
Yeah, and and ask for reviews, and then because it seems few like people there's a lot of interest in solving the problem. Correct, exactly. Not specifically yeah. the draft itself, okay. but for now. Okay, so let's let's keep talking about this, which is good. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you, guys, and uh, gentlemen. Oh, go ahead. And thanks for the meeting minute, Dacus, uh, yeah. Joe, and Kalia. It was like this was like writing heavy. It's like a book. Thank you, thank you, guys, and see you Friday.